Dear viewers, Shankara His Academy is bringing to your attention that a new batch in our prelims test series is starting this month. Yes, the admissions for this new pre-storming batch is open now. The orientation for the same has started yesterday and the test will commence in 4 days. That is on 15th October 2022. This batch will consist of 66 tests. These tests will be conducted in both online and offline mode. Test discussion classes will also be provided. Hurry and register to use the most reliable prelims test series. Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 10th of October 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. You can have a look. With this, let's start our discussion. Have a look at this news article. This article talks about NCST that is the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. The news article reports that the NCST has expressed concern over the misery of widows. Here the issue is that the husbands of these women died after suffering from lung ailments. This was due to the exposure to harmful particles in a pyropilate grinding unit at Odisha. See, the exposure to crystalline silica led to silicosis. And what is meant by silicosis? See, silicosis is a long-term lung disease caused by inhaling large amounts of crystalline silica dust. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. Then, we will also see about the National Commission for Scheduled Caste and also about the newly constituted National Commission for Backward Classes. First, let me start with some important facts about all these three commissions which is very important for prelims. See, all these three commissions are constitutional bodies. NCSC, NCST, NCBC are mentioned in Articles 338, 338A and 338B of the Indian Constitution respectively. Here, know that before 2003, there was only one commission for both scheduled caste as well as scheduled tribes. But the 89th constitutional amendment of 2003 bifurcated the combined National Commission for Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes into two separate bodies. That is why at present Article 338 deals with the National Commission for Scheduled Castes and Article 338A deals with the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. Now, let me start the discussion with the comparison of the National Commission for Scheduled Caste and National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. Firstly, as we have already seen, National Commission for Scheduled Caste is mentioned in Article 338, while National Commission for Scheduled Tribes is mentioned in Article 338A. Secondly, the NCSC consists of a chairman, vice chairman and three other members. And for NCST also, the structure is same. Now, coming to the conditions of service and tenure of both the NCSC and the NCST chairperson, vice chairperson and members. See, it is all determined by the president. Yes, all are appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal. Both the commissions NCSC and NCST had been given with the power to regulate its own procedure. Now, coming to the duties of the commissions. See, the NCSC will investigate monitor and evaluate all matters relating to the safeguards provided for the scheduled castes. Then they inquire into specific complaints with respect to the deprivation of rights and safeguards of scheduled castes. Then they participate and advise on the planning process of socio-economic development of the scheduled caste. They also evaluate the progress of their development under the union and the states. Then they also present to the president the reports and it is done annually as required by the president. Thus, NCSC performs the functions of protection, welfare and development and advancement of the scheduled caste. And while inquiring, know that the NCSC has all the powers of the civil court, that is, they can summon and enforce the attendance of any person from any part of India. Not only these, they can request for any public record from any court or any other government office in India. Also note that the union and every state government shall consult the commission on all major policy matters affecting scheduled castes. This is all with respect to the duties of the National Commission for Scheduled Caste. Now coming to the duties of the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes, the duties of NCSTs are same as that of the duties of the NCSC. The only difference is NCST does all these for scheduled tribes and not for scheduled caste. This is all with respect to the both NCSC and NCST. 
Now, before coming to the National Commission for Backward Classes, let us know when it was first created. See, previously, according to Article 338, Clause 10, the NCSC had to investigate all matters relating to the constitutional and other legal safeguards for the other backward classes and the Anglo-Indian community. But the 102nd Constitutional Amendment Act said that the provisions related to other backward classes in Article 338, Clause 10 shall be omitted. And the Constitutional Amendment Act established a separate National Commission for Backward Classes. So, now this Article 338 applies one to Anglo-Indian communities. This Constitutional Amendment created a body called National Commission for Backward Classes under Article 338B of the Indian Constitution. See, regarding NCBC's structure, powers and duties, everything is similar to that of NCSC and NCST. The only difference is, NCBC is working for the backward classes in India. Pay attention here. See, there was a question in Mains 2022 in GS Paper 2 regarding the Article 338B. The question is displayed here. Pause the video and have a look. Now, coming to the answer for this question. See, the answer for this question is given in the article itself. Yes, Article 338B Class 5 contains the duty of the commission, which is what the question asked for. Through this Article 338B, the Commission gains the power of civil court. This is all with respect to NCSC, NCST and the NCBC. Make note of all the points which we have discussed in this discussion. This will be very helpful for you in the prelims examination. With these key learned points, now let us move on to the next news article. Let's take up this editorial article. Here, the author speaks about the reasons for the decline of private capital formation in India and about the need for public investments to boost private investments. See, he also mentions about the 2008 global financial crisis and the subsequent downturn of private investment in India. This is the overall crux of the article given here. So, in this context, let's learn about what is gross capital formation, the impact of the 2008 global financial crisis on the Indian economy, then also about the reasons for the decline of private capital formation in India as discussed by the author in the article and finally about the recent increase in public investments in India. Before getting into the discussion, the syllabus relevant to this article is given here for your reference. Now, let's start with the term gross capital formation. See, gross capital formation means an amount of money spent in the economy which tends to add to the fixed assets of the economy. Here note that gross capital formation also includes net changes in the level of inventories. Here the term fixed assets include land improvements such as construction of fences, ditches, drains and so on. Then fixed assets also include production plants, machinery and equipment purchases. It also includes construction of roads, railways, schools, offices, hospitals, private residential dwellings and commercial and industrial buildings. Now coming to the term inventories. See, the term inventories refer to the raw materials used in the production as well as the goods produced that are available for sale. Know that gross capital formation would happen by both private and public investments. Here, the investments may also come from foreign nations as foreign direct investments or foreign portfolio investments. Now, let us move to see about the impacts of the 2008 global financial crisis on the Indian economy. Before that, let us first understand the crisis in brief. See, the cause of the crisis was the burst of the housing bubble in the United States. Now, let's first see what is a bubble. See, in economics, a bubble is a term used to denote the increase in price of an asset above its true intrinsic or fundamental value. For example, if the fundamental value of a pen is Rs 20, but due to some external reasons the price increases to Rs 2000, it is called a bubble. Tulip bubble of Netherlands is another example which you can relate to. Now coming back, from the 1990s until February 2007, the price of the houses in the USA increased by a staggering 130% as more people were interested in buying houses at that time. This was called the housing bubble. And this led to reckless lending by banks in the USA to the borrowers who were with low credit worthiness for buying a house. By September 2007, the price of the houses had declined due to less demand. Add to it the high interest rates, the borrowers weren't able to repay the loan and subsequently the bank suffered heavy losses. This is what is termed as the burst of the housing bubble and it is the primary cause of the 2008 global financial crisis. 
Now let's see about how the 2008 crisis impacted the Indian economy. See, in 1991, India started implementing the policy of economic liberalization, which resulted in the opening up of Indian market to the outside forces in different areas. Their liberalization policy had attracted foreign direct investments in the various industry sectors and also portfolio investments in the Indian capital markets, which include stock markets. So, during the 2008 global financial crisis, many foreign companies have pulled out investments from India. This caused a stock market crash, reduction in gross capital formation, and this fueled the slowing down of our economy. The other impacts include rise of unemployment, increase in government debt, less spending by the government on welfare schemes, loss in the value of assets, etc. So, the Indian government boosted the public investment during this period to overcome the crisis. This is what the author termed as stimulus in the article. This is all with respect to the 2008 global financial crisis and its subsequent impact on the Indian economy. Now, let's see the reasons for the decline of private capital formation in India post the global financial crisis. See, the 2008 global financial crisis which we discussed had slowed the world economy and subsequently the export growth also declined in India. This situation reduced the demand in the economy and the private investors didn't overcome this situation. So, there was a widely reported decline in the gross capital formation by the privates in India. According to the author, the ideology of minimum government which means encouraging private spending on capital formation over public spending haven't yielded the necessary results till now. He also states that demonetization, digitization of processes in various sectors and the rollout of GST are some of the other reasons for the decline of private capital formation in India. Now, finally, let's see about the recent change in trends in public investments in India. See, in the Union Budget 2022, there is a historical increase in the allocation for capital spending. This was done primarily keeping in mind the economic slowdown created by the COVID pandemic. Nearly 7.5 lakh crore out of the total 40 lakh crore expenditure is sidelined for capital formation by the union government. Here also note that effective capital expenditure which also includes capital formation from revenue expenditure of the central government is estimated at Rs 10.68 lakh crore which is nearly about 4.1 percentage of the Indian GDP. This allocation will help to revive the economy post slowdown by crowding in the private investments. Here, capital assets created by the government through schemes like PM Gati Shakti will get the private to invest in the economy. This is what is called as crowding in of the private investments in the face of public investment. Also note that International Monetary Fund has suggested that public investment can play the role of an engine of growth for the developing ec economies like India. This is all with respect to this discussion. Through this lecture, we learned about the term gross capital formation, about the global financial crisis of 2008, its subsequent impact on the Indian economy, and also about the recent uptick in public investment in India. With this, let's move on to the next article. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the UN peacekeepers. This is in news because UN peacekeeping chief held a meeting in Delhi last week as part of his tour to India, Pakistan, UAE and Japan. In this meeting, he said that the UN soldiers needed a more robust, proactive mandate and better equipments. This is to deal with deteriorating conditions in countries where UN peacekeepers are posted. Also, in this meeting, India had proposed a 10-point plan. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss about this UN peacekeeping force. See, the UN peacekeeping operations are policing and peace building actions carried out by the UN. This is to bring order and stability in the war-torn nations. The UN peacekeepers are also known as blue helmets or blue barrettes. Its personnel consists of soldiers and military officers, police officers and also civilian personnel from many countries. Now, coming to the role of United Nations peacekeepers, the United Nations peacekeepers ensures that peace agreements or accords are implemented in war zones. In addition to this, they help the country's administration through confidence building measures, electoral support, improving law and order, and also bolstering social development that will bring positive economic changes. 
C. The United Nations Charter authorizes the United Nations Security Council to take collective action to maintain international peace and security. Due to this, it falls on the United Nations Security Council to deploy peacekeepers in order to ensure stability and security in conflict regions. Now coming to the structure. C. The United Nations Peacekeeping Force is supplemented by personnel from member countries. They are added to the force on a voluntary basis. Now the question is, which country contributes more number of personnel to this UN peacekeeping force? We can see from this bar graph that Bangladesh was contributing 5748 soldiers to United Nations peacekeeping missions. The next topper was Nepal. Nepal was followed by India who contributed around 5269 troops. See, this is an old data which was compiled on January 2022. As of June 2022, India has moved to the second place. That is, India contributes more troops than Nepal. Now, let us see about the procedure for initiating a UN peacekeeping mission. See, when a peace treaty is signed or negotiated, the parties involved might request the United Nations to deploy a peacekeeping force. This is to maintain order and ensure that the elements of the agreed upon peace treaty are implemented. Then, after the approval of a mission by the UNSC, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations make the necessary arrangements. The leadership team is formed after which the department will ask assistance from members of the UN in terms of force and supplies. Also an ADA coalition is formed in this regard. As the peacekeeping forces are being created, some behind the curtain diplomatic actions are also taken by the UN. The size and strength of the force are decided upon by the government in whose territory the peacekeeping force will be deployed. Along with this, the rules of engagement are formulated and agreed upon by the parties involved with approval from the UNSC. Then, once a force has been deployed, United Nations Special Committee for Peacekeeping Operation oversees the general contact and day-to-day -day operations in the deployed area. Do you know that India had UN peacekeeping forces present in its territory? Can you guess where it is? Yes. Kashmir region at the presence of UN peacekeeping forces just after the period of independence. Currently also, there is a minuscule amount of UN troops present in Kashmir. Now, coming to the finances of UN peacekeeping missions. See, a peacekeeping mission is funded collectively by the United Nations member states. While the establishment and maintenance of its operation are decided by the UNSC or the United Nations Security Council, as per the UN Charter, each member is legally bound to pay their individual share for peacekeeping. The expenses for a peacekeeping operation are divided by the United Nations General Assembly. This sharing is based on a formula that takes into account the economic condition of member states as one of the main factors. This is all regarding the finances of United Nations peacekeeping missions. Through this discussion, we came to know about United Nations peacekeeping forces, their official mandate and who has the power to deploy United Nations peacekeeping forces in war zones and also about the different countries' contribution to the peacekeeping missions. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next article discussion. Take a look at this image. It shows the reconstruction of Basamanna statue near Bangalore-Mysore Highway. See, he is a religious reformer who founded the Veera Saivism sect, which is now flourishing in present-day Karnataka with huge Lingayat population. In this context, let's see about Saivism, different sects of Saivism and their geographical extent, and also about Basavanna himself. First, let's start with Saivism. See, Saivism is one of the major Hindu tradition that worships Lord Shiva. The roots of Saivism were traced to prehistoric India where the evidence of the worship of Lord Shiva has been found in ancient archaeological sites such as Harappa and Mohajadaro. Here note that in the Rig Veda, Lord Shiva is referred by the name Rudra. Then between 700 and 1000 CE, Saivism progressed and eventually became the prominent religion of India, particularly in the south. The rulers of many major kingdoms became Shaivites and patronized its representatives. Magnificent temples were built in Shiva's name. Remember the great Tanjur Big Temple, which is recently seen in news due to the release of the Tamil movie? This is in brief about Saivism. Now, speaking about the sects of Saivism. See, there are three major sects in Saivism. They are Saiva Siddhanta, Kashmiri Saivism and Veera Saivism. Let's see about them one by one. First is Saiva Siddhanta. See, this school is popular mainly in southern India and 
It derives its doctrine from the works of several Saiva saints and philosophers from the south. The most prominent among them was Nambi and R. Nambi who composed Thirumurai which is considered as the foundational work of the school. The doctrine of Saiva Siddhanta also includes the works of several other saints such as Appar, Sundarar and Sambandar. Now coming to Kashmir Saivism. See, it derives its name from the region of Kashmir where it gained prominence before the immediate arrival of Islam in India. According to this school, Shiva is the ultimate reality and there is nothing beyond. Now, finally talking about Veera Saivism. See, Veera Saivism rose to prominence during the medieval period in Karnataka and the adjoining areas of Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Veera Saivism derives its name from the heroic nature of Shiva himself in his ferocious aspect as Veera Bhadra. The sect is also known as Lingayat since its followers wear a Shivalinga around their necks or on their bodies. The sect was made popular by Vasavanna in the Karnataka region in the 12th century. This is all with respect to the three sects of Saivism. Now we will see in brief about Vasavanna. See, Vasavanna was a 12th century philosopher, statesman, Kannada poet and a social reformer. Vasavanna spread social awareness through his poetry which is popularly known as Vachanas. Vasavanna rejected gender or social discrimination, superstitions and rituals. He introduced a new public institution named Anubhava Mantava which is also called as Hall of Spiritual Experience which welcomed both men and women from all socio-economic backgrounds to discuss spiritual ideas and questions of life. Basavanna championed devotional worship that rejected temple worship and rituals by Brahmins. He tried to replace it with personalized direct contact of Shiva through practices such as individually worn icons and symbols like a small linga. This is all about Basavanna. Through this discussion, we came to know about different sects of Saivism and also about the details of the sect called Lingayats. With this, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article reports about the Crimea Bridge Blast. See, Russian President Vladimir Putin blamed Ukrainian secret services for this huge blast. This is the crux of the news article given here. Let's not get too deep into this issue. Instead, let us take this opportunity to learn about Crimean Peninsula in geographical perspective. See, this Crimean Peninsula lies between the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Russia uses Black Sea to project its power in the Mediterranean. And this Black Sea had for centuries been a flashpoint between Russia and its competitors such as Turkey, France, US and the UK. Know that Russia seized and annexed the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine in the year 2014. Since then, it considers the area around the Crimean coast to be Russian waters. However, Western countries deem the Crimean Peninsula to be a part of Ukraine and reject Russia's claim to the seas around it. Now, let us know about three straits located in this region that is the Dardanelles Strait, Kurtz Strait and the Bosporus Strait. First of all, what is a strait? See, a strait is a narrow piece of sea that joins two larger seas. Have a look at these maps. Here you can see that this Bosporus Strait connects the Black Sea with the Sea of Marmara, Kurtz Strait connects the Sea of Azov with the Black Sea and the Dardanelles Strait connects the Egan Sea with the Bosporus Sea. This is all with respect to the straits present in the Eastern European region. Now coming to the annexation of Crimean Peninsula by Russia. This Crimean annexation by the Russia was the first time a European country annexed territory from another country post World War II. This was followed by Russian military intervention in other parts of Ukraine. The invasion and subsequent annexation of Crimea have given Russia a maritime upper hand in the region. With this, now let us look at this news article. See, this news article talks about a Russian missile barrage that crumbled apartment buildings and houses in Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. See, let us take this opportunity to learn about this Zaporizhia city and the Dnieper river flowing through it. Zaporizhia is one of the largest industrial and cultural centers in the south of Ukraine. It also has the presence of the largest nuclear power plant in all of Europe. Note that this nuclear power plant has lost its last remaining external power source. This is because of the result of renewed shelling and the power plant is now relying on emergency diesel generators. Now coming to the Dnieper river, it is the fourth longest European river after the Volga, Danube and the Ural. This river flows in southern direction through western Russia, 
Belarus and Ukraine. This is all with respect to the geography of the Dnieper River. See, there has been frequent map-based questions being asked in the prelims examination. So, I am going to give you some additional important rivers which you should make note of. Volga, Danube, Don and Seine. Look through your atlas to make note of these rivers and important capital cities through which these rivers traverse. With this, we have come to the end of this particular discussion. We learned about the important strides in the Eastern European region and also about the Zaporizhia city in this discussion. With this, let's move on to the next article discussion. Take a look at this editorial article. It talks about the importance of semiconductor industry. See, the semiconductor industry is exclusively concentrated in the East Asian countries like Taiwan and South Korea. I have already discussed this topic in detail in our Hindu daily news analysis dated 27th September 2022. If you want to get a clear picture of what is a semiconductor, applications of it and also about why Taiwan is a world leader in the semiconductor production, India's policies in regard to the development of semiconductor industry, you can click on the link given in the description and watch the video. It will be very useful for your mains paper GS3. With this, let's move on to the next part of our discussion that is prelims practice question. See, we have taken two different questions for today's discussion. Let's start with the first question. It is a two statement question and the question asked for the incorrect statement. Let me read out the question first. Consider the following statements with reference to the National Commission for Scheduled Caste. Statement 1 says that it is empowered to monitor and evaluate the welfare measures taken for both scheduled castes and the Anglo-Indian community. This statement is correct. This is what we have seen in our today's news analysis. Now coming to the second statement. The chairperson is selected by a committee set up by the Prime Minister. This statement is incorrect because the chairperson is appointed by the President directly. So statement 2 is incorrect. So the correct answer for this question which asks for the incorrect statement is option B 2 only. Moving on to the next question. See, it is a map based question. Let me first read out the question. Consider the following strides. 1. Bosporus strait. 2. Dardanelles strait. 3. Kerch strait. The question asks for the Strites which are directly connected with Black Sea. Coming to the first strait, Bosporus Strait. See, from the map given here, we can see that Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea are connected through the Bosporus Strait. So, Bosporus Strait has a direct connection with the Black Sea. Now, coming to the third strait, which is the Kerch Strait, Sea of Azov and the Black Sea are connected through this strait. So, Strait 1 and Strait 3 has a direct connection. Now, coming to the second strait, Dardanelles Strait. See, Dardanelles Strait connects Sea of Marmara with Aegean Sea and it does not have a direct connection with Black Sea. So, Strait 2, Dardanelles Strait doesn't have any direct connection with Black Sea. So, the correct answer for this question is option C, 1 and 3 only. Displayed here are the prelims practice question for you. Interested aspirants can post the correct answer in the comment section. Mains practice question is displayed here. Again, interested aspirants can write your answer and upload it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. If you have liked our video, please hit the like button, do comment and share it with your friends. To watch more videos like this, please subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you.